And so tonight in the Bible reading program, we're kind of in the middle of Acts. And so as I'm looking at Acts and trying to figure out, okay, what would be the most important thing to, to talk about this week? Well, Acts chapter 15 was the most important thing to talk about. And this is what we call the First Jerusalem Council. So this is a big church meeting that was assembled to uh, come to an agreement, come to a recommendation to the entire church, church with a capital C, the universal church, as to an important matter of doctrine. And here we see it. So if you want to open up your Bibles, or you can follow along above my head, of course, to Acts chapter 15. So the Jerusalem Council takes place about 48 to 50 AD. So we're about somewhere between 15 to 25 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And the church has been spreading. We've got, uh, you know, we've got persecution forcing people out of Jerusalem into Samaria and out of Samaria into the outermost parts of the world. And they're spreading the gospel with them. But with this has come uh, some false teaching. Some people with some strange ideas have brought it in. And with that comes disagreements within the church. And hey, 2,023 years later, thereabouts, we're still dealing with this matter. So God is working with imperfect men and women to put together his church. And there's going to be disagreements, and there's going to be matters of opinion, and there's going to be different flavors of things. But tonight, we're going to look into one that's vitally important. This council establishes an answer to the most vital doctrinal question that Sammy, if you can bring that up, or Jeff's running it. And it's this question, what must a person do to be saved? I think we can all agree this is like, in terms of Bible questions, this is pretty much number one, right? What do I need to do to be saved? And that's what this council has assembled to look at. Now, many councils have followed and have dealt with many other subjects throughout church history. And we kind of take those decisions for granted now. We're here hundreds or thousands of years later, and these decisions that have been made, we take as being, oh, well, of course, that's what it means. I mean, even decisions as to what books were selected throughout history that would be included in our Bibles that we have on our laps, those were councils and groups, and they were debated, and they were batted around, and then finally they came to an agreement. And so these councils have affected our lives as Christians from the very beginning. Here's a cool council to talk about. Bring up the next slide, Jeff. Uh, this is an icon from the first council of Nicaea. This is in 325 AD. This was the first ecumenical council. Ecumenical means worldwide. And so at the time, this guy right in the middle in the red robe, that's Emperor Constantine, the Roman emperor. And at that time, when you thought of the word worldwide, that meant the Roman Empire, because truly they had conquered the world. And uh, he brought this together because they had very important matters to discuss. About 318 delegates came together to debate the big question. And the question that they talked about, well, they talked about a few things, but the big question was whether Jesus was created or not. And you know, the Bible tells us that Jesus, uh, that God begot Jesus. Jesus was begotten, right? And uh, this council, we're discussing that. Now we had uh, Arius, this guy down here, who does not look like a bishop because he wasn't. He was one of the teachers that say, no, Jesus was created. God had to have created him. And the rest of the bishops, in fact, the vast majority, I think only three votes were for Jesus being created. The rest of the bishops came together and said, no, Jesus is part of the Trinity. Jesus is co-equal with God. Jesus was begotten. He was incarnate. He came in a human body. But that doesn't make him any less uh, powerful or co-equal with God. Jesus was there at the beginning in creation, helping God the Father to create this entire universe that you and I enjoy right now. And that was decided there at the Council of Nicaea. And, uh, of course, this is where we get the Nicene Creed. And maybe you're like me. I came out of the Episcopal Church as a child, right? My parents raised me Episcopal. And the Nicene Creed was something that we repeated, I think, every Sunday. And if you came out of the Catholic Church, you would probably hear the Nicene Creed on most Sundays. That came from this meeting. Let's go to the next picture. 
Let's read the Nicene Creed together. You got the next one, Jeff? There it is. Let's read that together. (laughs) And there's Constantine in the middle holding his symbol of uh, emperorship, the scepter there, and uh, that's what they came up with. Here's a fun fact about the Council of Nicaea. One of the attendees was Nicholas of Myra. Anybody knows who Nicholas of Myra was? John Blaubach. St. Nicholas, yeah. Yeah, the basis from which we get Santa Claus. Thank you, John. (laughs) All right. So let's uh, dig into the Bible here. Acts chapter 15, we're going to read verses 1 through 5. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all the things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So let's pray. Father, as we open up this passage of Scripture, we ask you to uh, give us understanding. This is a, such an important piece of our history, both as believers and the entire world, that the gospel would actually go beyond the Jews and to the Gentiles, of which I am one and, and many of us listening today. And we ask, Father, that you would help us to understand that where our faith comes from and what we must do do to be saved. And so speak to us this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. So at this time in the book of Acts, if we are reading it just from beginning to end, we are with Paul and Barnabas in the city of Antioch. Can you bring up that first map, Jeff? I like graphics, by the way. So Antioch is over here in what was Syria at the time, but now if you looked at a current political map, that's part of Turkey right there. And the blue line represents their first missionary journey. So Paul and Barnabas were living in Antioch, and it said that the Holy Spirit singled them out and said, you guys are going to go. And the church sent them out. So they got on a boat, went through Cyprus, and then went up into Pamphylia, and went through all the things to Derby, and then began their return trip back through a lot of the same cities they had gone to, strengthening and establishing elders, and then made their way back to Antioch. Now, when they got back to Antioch, they were, finding in their notes, oh, next, next map, uh, Jeff. Okay, so here's modern uh, Middle East. And Antioch is the uh, pin drop at the top there. So if you were to walk all the way to Jerusalem, that's about 400 miles. If you're doing about 20 miles a day, that takes you about 20 days to get to Jerusalem. I just wanted to show you what the scope was here so you can understand some of the background of what we're talking about tonight. Now, uh, if you wanted to see the first missionary journey, you're going to read Acts 13 and 14. That documents their trip. Now, in each stop along their way, they were going into the synagogues first, and they were preaching Christ to the Jews in that synagogue. But in those synagogues, you also have proselytes, people that were converted to Judaism. And those people were considered Gentiles by birth, but they were Jewish by religion, let's say. And so those guys were hearing the, uh, hearing the message they were giving also. And we read in Acts 13, verses 44 through 48, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first 
But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. That was Paul quoting Isaiah 49, 6. Now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as been appointed to eternal life believed. So that was Paul and Barnabas's pattern. Go into a city, sit down or stand up, however they did it at the synagogue, and preach Christ. Then, of course, they get kicked out of the synagogue. <laughs> but the Gentiles who heard the message were so excited. Paul, tell us more. We want to know this Jesus. And so Paul has to set up shop somewhere else in the city, and then all the Gentiles come to him. So Paul and Barnabas are seeing tons of Gentiles getting saved. And they're experiencing signs and wonders and miracles amongst these Gentiles, which to them is God's stamp of approval saying, hey, these are my people now. Now, after returning to Antioch at the end of their first missionary journey, there's about eh, maybe a year gap between, before we get to chapter 15, which we're starting in. And... Uh, now we see some people move in. So just looking back at verse 1 of chapter 15. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So these teachers, these guys came from Judea. You saw it up there. So uh, the Bible, not the Bible, Bible scholars refer to them as Judaizers. These were people that wanted to take the Gentile believers and drag them back into uh, the Jewish faith. They had to do certain things in order to be Christians. You see, up until this time, Christianity is what came out of Jerusalem and the Jews. And so in their minds, they say, well, first you have to be circumcised. That's the sign of Abraham, right? Abraham's covenant. And every good Jew had to be circumcised on the eighth day. And then you have to keep the law of Moses. That's what every Jew has to do also. And only then can you add Christ on top of that and be saved. And so the Judaizers are trying to pull people back under the law of Moses. Now, this was completely opposite to what Paul was preaching all through his first missionary journey. Paul never taught that, hey, guys, we're going to have a circumcision ceremony on Saturday night. Everybody come on over to the house. We'll get everybody taken care of. We'll have a little mosaic bible study after which and then i'll teach you about jesus now he was going straight to jesus so in fact we read in ephesians 2 8 for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of god this is the message that paul was preaching galatians 2 16 knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in jesus christ even we have believed in jesus in christ jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So when the Judaizers show up in Antioch and they're teaching this doctrine, you have to be circumcised, you have to follow the law of Moses, and then you can become saved and follow Christ. Paul, oh man, I can only imagine what he said. Acts 15 verse 2 tells us, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, I think that's an understatement. Paul was a gnarly dude. This was, this was probably a big blow up. And they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. I feel sad for the Judaizers because could you imagine debating Paul? I wouldn't want to. I don't even want to haggle with that guy over a used car. I just, you know what? Whatever price it is, you, you win. You win. That guy, he was, he, was a, he was a gnarly dude, to put it into California terms. But thankfully, somebody had the clarity of mind there in the city of Antioch to suggest, hey guys, let's take this debate to a higher authority. Let's go to Jerusalem, to the seat of Christianity in the world at the time, and let's, uh, let's let those guys decide it. And so let's jump into verse 3, Acts 15. And so being sent on their way to, by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles 
and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So I love how Paul and Barnabas on their journey, and let's just say it's 20 day journey, on their 20 day journey to Jerusalem, how they kept sharing the testimony of everything that God had done with them and through them with the Gentiles in all the cities that they had visited. It's almost like they're trying to build up popular opinion so that when they get to Jerusalem, the popular opinion will be in their favor. And when you saw that in verse three, how this caused great joy among all the brethren. The people were digging it. They was, this, is, this is great, I can't believe it. Gentiles could be saved? What a novel idea. But uh, maybe these Judaizers weren't traveling with them because it doesn't say that the Judaizers were giving their side of the debate, who knows. But it didn't matter because uh, Paul had plenty of Judaizers waiting for him in Jerusalem. These Pharisees who were believers but still maintained that you had to be under Moses in order to be a Christian. Let's jump into verse 6 where the council assembles. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Okay, so the council has now come together in Jerusalem. And it's important to kind of figure out, like, who are the leaders of this council? So uh, we've got Peter there, obviously, because he just spoke. We've got James, which was Jesus' brother there, also called in church history James the Just. And we've got John, the Apostle John, the writer of the Gospel of John, the writer of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the writer of, of Revelation. So these are, big, these are heavy hitters. These are apostles with a capital A, right? These are people anointed and sent by God God breathed, or Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter, on this, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. These are the guys with the answers. Now, we also know, just parenthetically, that this wasn't James, John's brother. Remember James and John, the sons of Zebedee? He had been martyred back in chapter 12. So he's no longer with us. So this is most certainly Jesus' half-brother, James. Now, Paul, when he's recounting this meeting of the church in Galatians chapter 2, in verse 9, he calls these three guys, James, Peter, and John, pillars of the church. So there's no doubt in our minds that Paul was willing to, uh, I don't know a good word for this, bow the knee. I mean, he was willing to uh, kiss the ring. <laughs> Is that what you said? <laughs> He was willing to submit to their authority. Let's put it that way. He was willing to submit to their authority. He considered them to be pillars. Now, Peter recounts his Acts chapter 10 story of the conversion of Cornelius and his family. And just for uh, brevity, I'll just bring you up to speed in case you're not familiar with that. Cornelius was a Roman, and Cornelius was told in a vision to go to Joppa and to find a guy named Peter who's at Simon the, Simon the Tanner's house and invite him to come to your house and to share this interesting message with you. And so Cornelius does that. He sends a couple servants to go fetch Peter. Meanwhile, Peter is on the roof of this house and has a vision where a large sheet filled with all different kinds of food and both clean and unclean animals is, descends from heaven and he's told three times to kill and eat. 
And Peter just says, no, not so, Lord. I mean, my lips have never tasted unclean food like that, you know, non-kosher food. And what does the Spirit tell him? What God has called clean, don't call unclean. And then immediately the sheet is taken up and these messengers come and say, hey, would you come to this guy's house? And the Spirit tells Peter, go with them. Go to a Gentile's house and tell them the message, the good news. Now, Peter, being a good Jew, uh, first of all, you know, he would have a kosher diet, which we already talked about that sheet. But second of all, he wouldn't enter a Gentile's house. That would make him unclean also. And yet the Spirit told him, go with these men. It's okay. And so God was telling him, hey, the ministry's open to the Gentiles. Now, he gets to Cornelius' house. He asks Cornelius, why am I here? Cornelius tells him, I was told in a vision to get, to get you. And of course, Peter shares the gospel message with Cornelius and his household, and they get saved, and the Holy Spirit pours out on them just like the day of Pentecost, where people are speaking in tongues. And Peter and the rest of the Jewish believers that are with him are blown away. Are you kidding me? Gentiles can receive the same spirit that us Jews can? It was a huge deal. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48, recount it. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and then they asked him to stay a few days. So as far as Peter's concerned, that was proof enough. They received exactly the same gift that the Jewish believers received. And Peter, thankfully, has eyewitnesses with him that would attest to the same thing. So that was the first speech in defense of salvation by faith alone and not being under the Mosaic law for your salvation. Now Paul and Barnabas get their chance in verse 12. This is the second speech in defense of salvation by faith. Verse 12, Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. So this is an important part, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on Cornelius' household and the wonders and miracles that Paul and Barnabas experienced with the Gentile believers in the cities that they ministered in was proof to these men, to these apostles, that God had indeed blessed and accepted these Gentiles as believers and a part of the family. And now they're able to share this with the rest of this council. And this must have been all the proof that they needed as they were debating this topic, they received the same gifts of the Spirit that the Jewish believers did. God had put their, his stamp of approval on them. Now, James rises. This is Jesus' brother. And he's going to make the case for salvation by faith alone, and he's going to use a little bit of Old Testament Scripture to back it up. We read that in verses 13 to 22. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared, that's Peter, Simon Peter, has declared how God had first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written, After this I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and will set it up and so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who were called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted from, by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And then it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch 
with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So there's the third speech. James kind of wraps it up right there. He's willing to look to the Old Testament and say, hey, God promised he was going to take even of the Gentiles and bring them into his family. And then he kind of lays out the decree. Men, I suggest that we make the following decree, and he, he kind of outlines it there. I've got, to, I've got to quote David Guzik. Why not? Listen to this. If the decision was that one did not have to be Jewish to be Christian, Christian, it must also be said clearly that one did not need to forsake the law of Moses to be a Christian. So we have to note that in what James has said. James didn't say, you know what, guys? I'm reversing my circumcision. I'm casting off the law of Moses, and I'm going to become as the Gentiles are. He, he didn't say that we had to neglect the law of Moses. But what he did say is the Gentile believers don't have to convert to Judaism first. Now, but note that the Gentiles, in the end there, there were four things that the Gentiles were asked to do. Some requirements, or what he would call necessary changes to their behavior or lifestyle. So it kind of appears to be a little maybe compromise here. You see, they're working in, a, in this council. They've got the Judaizers there, the Pharisees. They've got the Paul and Barnabas and the rest of these. I'm not sure. Let's see. There was at least one Gentile there, Titus, right? Because in Galatians 2, it says that Titus did not feel compelled to be circumcised. And I believe he was there in Jerusalem with him, one of the traveling companions. But uh, these guys were there, and uh, these requirements were given or suggested by James. And I want to put it forth to you that this is not out of legalism. Like these are four requirements that must be adhered to by the Gentile believers in order to be saved. But rather these were requirements brought out of love in order to foster unity amongst the early church. Because remember, Christ had gone first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. The church was filled with Jewish believers who were not going to cast away the law of Moses. They were going to continue to live that lifestyle under Christ. And so these different things were some requirements that the Gentile believers were going to have to change in their own patterns of behavior, such as uh, maintaining a kosher diet. They weren't to eat things that were strangled. They weren't to eat, uh, drink the blood or eat meat with the blood still in it. You know, this is to promote some sort of uh, just this family thing. You don't do things to your wife that you know bug her, right? You shouldn't do that. And, and if you want to live in unity with your brothers and sisters, you know, you, there's certain things that you have to not do or do, like putting the toilet seat down. I mean, those kind of things, right? So in this way, these are just really, really smart words that we're going to foster unity amongst that church. Now, the council puts together a decree, a letter, which was going to go to Antioch to explain to all the Christians there their um, judgment on the matter. And uh, we read that in Acts 15, verses 28 and 29. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Note that he's, James calls them necessary things. That you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. That was just, I didn't go through the whole decree because it was what we had just read, but that was how they ended the letter. And I'm sure that these first century Christians found those requirements profitable. Not only to foster unity within the church, but uh, I mean, keeping yourself away from sexual immorality, I would ask you, does that lead to good things or bad things? Typically to good things. Uh, sexual, immor sexual immorality can lead to a lot of terrible burdens on your life. Uh, a lot of hurt and a lot of trauma, if you want to put it that way. 
and they wanted to keep these guys from that. But remember, these Gentiles are coming out of pagan religions where sexual immorality was a form of worship. And so they had to be taught not to do these things. Also, that they, wouldn't, uh, that they would keep some of the Levitical marriage laws. You know, you, you don't marry family members. Uh, you don't take a, a woman and her sister. I mean, these, these kind of things which would lead to a bunch of friction within the church. Now, but know that their salvation was not dependent on that. Uh, James did not end the letter, or you will not be saved. He just said, from these, you will do well. You will find them profitable, is what he said. And then if we look at verses 30 and 31 of Acts 15, we can see how the church in Antioch received that message. So they were sent off and came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. And I would add, and the men of the Antioch church let out a collective sigh <sighs> because they don't have to be circumcised. So they rejoiced. This, these four requirements that were given by the Jerusalem council were not a burden to these first century Christians. They rejoiced to receive this. And I'll bet you that the Jewish believers in that body also rejoiced. That they, Okay, good. I can actually go to that guy's house and share a meal with him because I know he'll follow these patterns and I can eat it with good conscience. So, history has also shown us that not every church council gets it right. There's been a lot of bad calls in church history. David Guzik, of course, has got a fantastic series on church history. And you can see some of the hits and misses if you listen to some of his stuff. But thankfully, this church council got it right. The Holy Spirit testifies to that because here it is, preserved for us over these thousands of years in our Bibles. And the teaching of the apostles and the teaching of the Old Testament prophets all falls in accordance with this. That you and I are saved by faith alone and not through the works of our hands. So our application this evening. We get calls at the church. I've been here 16 years, I think, next month. And it's been a pleasure to be serving you guys in this capacity. But we get calls every week. We get prayer chain uh, requests every week of people that are questioning their salvation. And they said, I've been a Christian all my life, but now I'm questioning it. And maybe you've thought that way at times and questioned your own faith. Part of the problem with questioning your faith is uh, typically that comes after a big failure. You know, a big sin. Or, or we didn't live up to our own expectations about our own life. And then we think in our hearts, how can God love me if I can't even toe the line on these simple things or these challenges in my life? If you've had those thoughts, or if you've made yourself your own law, I have to do X, Y, and Z in order to be good with God, I'm here to remind you, and the first council in Jerusalem are here to remind you that you're saved by faith and faith alone. It doesn't mean that our failures aren't going to have consequences in this life, but it does not take away your salvation. I'm going to read the uh, words of Paul again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so, church, tonight, I invite you to rest in these words. Christ's work has accomplished your salvation. The faith that you show for Christ is a gift from God. And you're secure in that. And the church let out a collective sigh. 
Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful that we don't have to work our way to heaven because I blow it every day. But your grace is sufficient and you have provided us a pathway. You have provided us a light for our feet. You have provided us the gift of salvation. And for that, we are very thankful. Lord, in our times of weakness, strengthen us by your Spirit that we would not question our own salvation, but rather rather we would learn from it, take instruction from it, seek counsel on it, that we would lift up our burdens to you and take on your burden because yours is light and ours is so heavy. And Father, we ask that we would step out with this message of salvation to the whole world, that they can be saved, and that we don't have to burden them with extra stuff. Faith in you is all we need. And we thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Guys, the prayer team is going to be up here. And if you're struggling, if there's something, if you've added extra laws, if you've added extra burdens to your life and in your walk with Christ, come up and let's leave them up here on the altar because uh, that's exactly what Christ instructed us to do. Have a good night.